Are you encouraged by that? <laughs> it's a true story. I'd love to have, it'd be great if we had some footage of that, wouldn't it? You can just kind of, I, what I love most about that is you can just feel the faith kind of building and building, you know? Can you imagine being there at the time, watching him with the wheelbarrow, going across and being in that crowd, and you're like, yes, come on, we're no longer a slave to fear. When peace like a river tethers. And then he says, hop on in. And you're like, yeah, no thanks, pass. It's a lot easier, isn't it? When, when things are going well in life, it's, very, it's, it's easy to be filled with faith in one sense. Uh, it's when life gets a bit choppy and, and it becomes all very real that uh, maybe uh, some of our fears set in. So it's uh, a privilege to uh, be continuing this series, Who You're Listening To, and um, we're talking today about fear and faith. How many of you like uh, thriller movies or suspense movies? You like watching, so it's not everybody's cup of tea. Some people love watching them, some people don't. I remember years ago, my, my brother and I, um, when pay TV first came out, and one of the channels uh, on a Friday night, they used to play all like all these really awful B grade and some were C grade, I suspect, movies. And, uh, and we used to love just getting a pizza and watching these dreadful thriller and suspense, like kind of really old movies, 60, 70 years old. And they had actors like Vincent Price and Boris Karloff. Remember Boris? Was the original Frankenstein and, and Peter Lorre. So I remember Peter Laurie from the Maltese Falcon. He used to talk like this. And I had, you know, scary music. The suspense would build. And uh, there'd be those moments of just hanging. And you want to see what happens next. And big shadows on the wall. So you didn't actually see what was coming. You were more thinking about what is that shadow meant to be. I thought that was all intentional. I found out years later that, do you know why they used to have all those shadows on the wall in those scary old movies? It was because in the 1930s, the electricity was so expensive to run, they couldn't afford to run all the lights in the, this is true, and so they just used to carefully position a few lights and it would cast these big scary shadows on the walls of the sets and they went, yeah, that looks good, we'll just, we'll go with that. And it launched a whole style of filmmaking called film, film noir. So I used to love watching these movies with my brother, but the thing was, they became so predictable. You'd sit there, and Pastor Phil, you're a film buff. You're like, if it, was, it gets to the point where you kind of just go, yep, see that coming? Yep, scary music building. Yep, see that coming? And it's kind of, it's not that scary in the end. In fact, it becomes a bit humorous. If you, you try watching a scary movie with the sound off, you will laugh yourself silly, because you think, what is there to be scared of here? This is kind of... Ridiculous, and so we used to sit there and laugh, and it was uh, it was good fun. Such is the escapism uh, of the movies. But fear in real life is a lot different, isn't it? When we come up against circumstances and situations uh, where maybe feelings of anxiety or powerlessness or feeling isolated set in, it's very real. We feel it. We all face fear at some point. It's a very human uh, experience. It's all part of life. But if we're not careful, those fears can really hold us captive. They really do. And they control our lives. And that's why I love that song we sang this morning. I'm no longer a slave to fear. Faith is also real. Faith, for me, and I know for many of you here, is faith is about knowing God and who He is as our Heavenly Father. Faith is about knowing who Jesus, His Son, is, but not, not just knowing who Jesus is, but who Jesus is in us when we have that revelation of what it means to walk with Jesus. And faith is about knowing the Holy Spirit and stepping into His enabling power for our lives. So today, who are you listening to? Are you listening to the voice of fear that sometimes can overwhelm us in situations and circumstances? 
Or are you listening to the voice of faith? The conviction of the Holy Spirit in our lives. I trust that today, that as you open your heart to Jesus, and this is something that's very personal, that you would acknowledge maybe some of the areas that uh, are fears for you, but don't further empower those fears. We don't give in to fear. Instead, we stir up the faith in Jesus that we have, who is the one that releases us from all fear. Praise the Lord. It's not about just faith over fear, mind over matter. It's about really acknowledging our fear. Let's be real, but we have a higher power. We have a God who loves us very much. And that's what we're talking about this morning. So we've been going through the books of uh, First and Second Timothy, and uh, we're kind of uh, moving into Second Timothy this week and next week, um, sharing from that. And I want to talk a little bit about uh, Timothy's character. Um, we've talked a lot about Paul. We know quite a bit about Paul, um, but there's, I guess there's less information around on Timothy. We have these two letters, of course, and Paul refers to Timothy in, in some of his other letters. But we don't have too much other uh, evidence or, or documents that tell us much uh, about Timothy. Um, and so I think it's interesting to kind of consider Timothy's character a little bit. There's a few bits of information that we've got, and I want to share about those a little bit before I, I get into um, what Paul said specifically to Timothy around fear and faith. It's interesting, Paul had a different perception of Timothy than what he had of himself. Well, that's, uh, that's my opinion anyway. And I think Paul saw things in Timothy that maybe he didn't even see in himself. For example, he saw a teaching gift. He said to Timothy, I want you to go out to all these churches in Ephesus and, and Corinth and all these places, and I want you to teach on certain doctrines and, and, and teach where there's some false doctrines and ideas coming through, he clearly saw a teaching gift. Why else would he send Timothy to do that job? He saw that uh, Timothy had the qualities of, uh, in the scriptures, they call him a deacon or overseer. He saw that he had the qualities of, of leadership. Again, why else would Paul appoint him to go and do that? He saw the evidence of it in Timothy's own life. He saw that uh, Timothy followed in the spiritual example of his mother and grandmother. It says that in the early part of the second letter to Timothy. He goes, I'm so encouraged by when I look, think of your mother, your grandmother, the good, strong spiritual example there, and I see the same thing in your life. In fact, he had to keep reminding Timothy. Uh, he would constantly, throughout the letters, keep saying, you know, don't forget, you've been called. Remember that time when I laid hands and prayed on you? Remember that word I prophesied over you? And others have seen it as, as well. So he had to keep reminding Timothy of that. Paul saw more than just Timothy's gifts. He saw his character. He saw someone who was obedient, who was trustworthy, and he saw somebody who had integrity. Timothy, on the other hand, in the natural I think, saw a couple of, of negative things about himself um, that, that may have re revealed some of his fears. And again, there's not a huge amount of it in the scripture, but um, there's a few things that maybe we get uh, an idea and indicator. Now, at this point uh, that, that Paul is writing these letters, Paul was towards the end of his life. He was in his mid to late 60s. Timothy, we think, was probably around 20, maybe a little bit younger, 15 to 20. And so Paul is, is really um, not just a father figure, but a grandfather spiritual figure to Timothy. And I think particularly in youth, there are several anxieties that, uh, that we go through as, uh, in our youth. And I think Timothy had some of them here. I think he was a very nervous young man. Um, couple of scriptures that, that suggest that too is 1 Timothy 5 23 
Paul gives him ad, uh, some advice. He says, look, stop drinking only water and just use a little bit of wine just because of your stomach and your frequent illnesses. Now, I don't want to read too much into this. Maybe there was a physical condition there. But also, with, with anxiety and nerves, it can really affect you in a physical way. And I suspect that there was a little bit of that with Timothy as well. He's not saying, he's not trying to prescribe alcohol as a solution to your problem. He's just saying, as responsibly, take a little bit of wine. That's going to help relax you in a physical sense and um, uh, emotionally as, as well. In fact, Paul had to remind other people that Timothy was prone to this. And when he wrote to the Corinthian church, he said this, When Timothy comes to you, see that that he has nothing to fear while he's with you, for he's carrying on the work of the Lord. And I think he did that because he knew that Timothy was, in the natural, prone to fear. I think he also felt inferior in himself. And again, Paul had to remind him in that first letter, 1 Timothy 4, don't let anybody look down on you. Because you're young, but set an example. And so it was easy. Uh, it is very easy to kind of go, oh, well, I'm just 15, 16. What, what can I be telling somebody who's twice, three times my age? It's easy to kind of let that overwhelm and, and kind of, uh, I guess, color your, the, the, your pers- perspective. Think about my own ministry journey as a young person. In that age, 15 to 20, outwardly, I felt very confident in my own ability. But inward, I would feel inferior or insecure in not so much ability, but in my identity. Because even though I love Jesus, I knew Jesus, he was in my life. Perhaps I think on reflection, I wasn't as secure in what it meant to walk with Jesus and what it meant to be a new creation in him. And so uh, it was tough sometimes. And so you can have bravado on the outside, but inwards you're going, nah, I've got jelly legs today. And so... I want to draw out a couple of things from the this second letter, particularly that uh, Paul wrote to Timothy, um, that I think would in- encourage all of us around fear and faith. And the first thing that I re- message I really think Paul was trying to get across is that fear might seem real, but it's not from God. God is very concerned about our circumstances. He's interested in the details of our life. He doesn't want to minimize those things and just say, well, just get over it. Just move on. The circumstances of our fear are very real. But it's important to remember those are not from God. Um, This week as I was preparing, I saw this uh, um, article on the ABC website about what's driving poor mental health among young Australians. Did anybody see that article on the ABC website? A couple of people. Um, it just it really caught my eye as I was praying and reflecting on this message. Um, and some of the quotes just really stood out to me. And so what they did was they interviewed five people, young people in different circumstances, and, uh, and asked them, well, you know, what do you think it is that may be behind poor mental health? Um, and I want to say that, actually, these are not just things that affect young people, but as I read through them, they affect people of all ages. And so maybe you can uh, connect with, with, with some of these comments and circumstances. One person said, I think a lot, of, a lot of it is this sense of uncertainty about the future, a sense that we aren't in full control of our lives. <gasps> Well, yep, that's true. We're not in control of our lives. And it can be a rude shock when you have that that revelation sometimes. It's like, okay, maybe I'm not in control of my life. They go on to acknowledge that the causes of mental health problems are very complex and varied. It's very easy, even in this day and age, to kind of, when when we say mental health, uh, we all might have a specific picture of what we think that means 
But in fact, the, the, the issues around mental health are hugely complex and varied. And they're linked sometimes inexplainably to social, economic, physical circumstances, spiritual circumstances in some cases. From there they go on and they, <clears throat> they just ask these five people, well, what do you think is one of the main factors behind uh, poor mental health? I'll just quickly go through them. The first person they asked said, oh, well, young people don't feel like their opinions matter. In other words, a feeling of worthlessness. It's a big one, big driver behind mental health issues. Another lady said, oh, eating disorders are super prevalent with people maybe who are struggling with a mental health issue. It's certainly the case in, in some situations. Uh, third person said, the proliferation of confronting content online, the social issues that come up and that we're just constantly bombarded with uh, online and current uh, uh, issues around the world. Another person said, barriers are a big problem to getting help, particularly people in regional uh, settings, so isolation is a big driving factor. And the fifth one, another person said, we have a high youth unemployment rate. In other words, again, a feeling of no purpose, no identity, where do I fit in here? Maybe I don't have a place. All those kind of questions playing on people's minds. Now, that's interesting that, that people are saying, well, that's what's driving um, mental health issues today. But you know what? When I think back 30, 40 years ago, apart from the online content bit, um, you could easily say that of people 30, 40 years ago. You could say that of people in Timothy's time. In fact, some of those things I've already suggested that Tim, maybe Timothy had fears around. So they're not that different. These are not new problems, and they're not just problems for young people either. And so this is really important where we need to get an understanding of, of not allowing fear, particularly in those early stages, to overwhelm us. Praise the Lord, we have wonderful medical help. I've just finished reading a little book about how Christians respond to, to mental health issues. And praise the Lord, we have wonderful research uh, today and, and doctors uh, who are, uh, can do, offer wonderful services in this area. But we also have a God who loves us and who wants to work in this area too. And, and this is where I think it's a really important one, getting on top of our fears before they get on top of, of us. So what did Paul say to Timothy, particularly around this topic? And I want to share with you a verse that I think has been a life verse for me. I've shared it with many, many other people. Uh, there's so much in it. And if you take nothing else from the message today, uh, receive this verse. Have a look what Paul said to Timothy. 2 Timothy 1 verse 7. And this is the New King James Version. For God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and a sound mind. Let that sink in a little bit. God has not given us a spirit of of fear. It does not come from him. What does he give us in place of that? He's given us power, love, and a sound mind. Now let's break those down a little bit. What does that actually mean? How does that help us when we experience fears? Well, I think when we're talking power, it's in place of a, a feeling of powerlessness. When we're afraid, there is a sense that we aren't in control. Isaiah said in the Old Testament, do not fear. Well, this is God speaking through Isaiah. This is the prophecy that God gave Isaiah. Do not fear, for I am with you. God is with us. Don't be dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you and help you. God is our great strength. In the moments when we feel at our weakest, he is our source of power and strength. He upholds us with his righteous hand. He also gives us love, love instead of hatred and fear. Look at this verse from 1 John. I love this, 1 John 4. There is no fear 
in love. Interesting. But perfect love drives out fear because fear has to do with punishment, whether we're punishing ourselves or feel like we're being punished by others. The one who fears is not made perfect in love. See, when we come to Jesus, when we get to know him, we find not just a love for God and, and a love for who he is and what he's done for us, but we also want to extend that to the people around us. He gives us a, a love for his creation, for his people. And thirdly, a sound mind instead of a, uh, an indecisive or immobilized mind. I love this verse from Romans. Again, another life verse for me. Don't conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Not a brainwashed mind. Not a mind where we just kind of, eh, okay, God, I'm just your puppet now. Do, do what you want. We're talking about a disciplined mind, a thinking mind, a logical mind, a strong mind. And a wise head, because it's not just all about logic and thinking, but when we have the Holy Spirit in our lives, He wants to lead us in a way when we make life decisions uh, and in directions, we want to make good choices. And so He gives us wisdom as well. I love the example of Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane, because I kind of see these, these two things, fear and faith, very strong in that story. Jesus is there. He's, he's weeping. He's kind of like at the end of his rope. He's praying and crying out to God and saying, Lord, if there's any other way, please take this cup away from me. I don't want to go through the pain. I don't want to go through those circumstances. He knew what was coming. There was fear, I think, there. Jesus, who was fully God and fully human at the same time, he was experiencing human fear. But he doesn't just leave it there because he says, Lord, not my will be done, but your will be done. He acknowledged his fear, but he stepped out in faith because he knew who God was. <laughs> Wow, what a release to know that we can pray to God like that as well. Be honest and open about our fears and about our, our life circumstances, but that we can stand on the truth of that promise uh, at the same time. See, fear is not just about being afraid and, and scared. That's a byproduct of fear. Fear is actually about what controls us. And when we have the Lord in our life, there's a, a thing such as holy fear that comes in. And that's about being in awe and reverence of who God is. It's about wanting to please him and, and honor him and obey him. Like a child before their parents. You know, I think of that e example, you know, particularly when we're younger and, and maybe, you know, your group of friends want to lead you a bit astray and something in the back of your mind goes, if I do that, my mom, my dad's going to kill me. <laughs> now, they're not really going to kill you, but it's about not wanting to disappoint your parents. You want your parents to think well of you. You want to honor them. And it's the same with God. Do you know, it's what motivated Noah to build the ark. Have a look at this verse from uh, Hebrews uh, chapter 11. By faith, Noah... When he was warned about things not yet seen, so he's just he's getting the inkling, he's heard from God, but he hadn't seen the evidence yet in, in the natural. When warned about things not yet seen, in holy fear, he built an ark to save his family. Everybody else around were going, you're crazy, man. What are you doing? They didn't believe, but Noah did. And it was that holy sense of reverence of God because he feared God. Not, not that he was afraid of God, but he wanted to please God. He wanted to be obedient to God. Timothy, he had real fears, but there was a greater motivation in his life. 
And fear of the Lord propelled him to want to be obedient in his faith. And he did. He stepped out in that. And it's the same for us. Once we understand that, we're positioned for faith also. So if fear is all about control, well, what's faith about? Well, I'm going to make a couple of comments uh, or, or draw on a couple of things from, from Paul in, in regards to faith. Because faith is the very nature of God. It's actually who he is. Have a look at this from uh, 2 Timothy uh, 2.13. He says, this is Paul again speaking to Timothy, if we're faithless, and sometimes we can feel that way, he remains faithful because he can't disown himself. It's who he is. He is faithful 100% of the time, always. I look at this description from Ephesians, which sometimes can roll off the tongue a little bit, because um, it sounds good. It's very poetic, beautiful language. But if you really let it kind of sink in, Ephesians 3.20, Now to him who is able to do immeasurably more or exceedingly abundantly above all that we can think or hope or imagine, according to the power that's at work in us. That's kind of a definition of who God is. He's so much bigger and more able than we can even hope or imagine. That's why we can put our faith and our trust in him. Faith is knowing who God is. Have a look at this from uh, 2 Timothy 1. Again, Paul says, that's why I'm suffering. At this point, Paul's in a jail. He's kind of, he's incarcerated. But it's not, it's no cause for shame. Because I know whom I have believed. Notice at that point, he doesn't say, I know what I have believed. Now, don't, don't misunderstand me. What we believe is very important. In fact, that's the, that's the context of these two letters. As he's quite often saying to Timothy, I want you to go to these churches because they're getting some funny thinking around what they believe. So we need to address that. But in this particular situation, he's saying when you're at the end of your tether, when you feel like everything else is on top of you, you have to know who you have believed. God, who is faithful 100% of the time, is what we fall back on. It's what Jesus did when he was on the cross. After he'd prayed in the garden, we know what happened. He was arrested, tried, he sentenced to be crucified on the cross. And there he was. And even on the cross, he was still letting the natural fear, human part of himself, be known, Father, why have you forgotten me? Why have you forsaken me? But he knew he really wasn't forgotten. He knew what was to come. And so in almost the same breath, he says, into your hands, I commit my spirit. I trust you 100% with my life. Because he knew what was to come. He knew that he would be resurrected to life. He knew that he was taking the sins of the world to the cross. And so, as we have a look uh, throughout the rest of, of this letter, have a look at this little um, Paul's descriptions of faith to Timothy. Have we got that screen there? This is just a few different uh, mentions of faith that Paul makes throughout this letter. Firstly, faith is sincere. He said to Timothy, I'm encouraged by the sincerity of your faith. He says, faith has to be stirred. In that uh, verse there, 1 verse 6, he says, Now stir it up, the gift that God has placed within you. And he's not just talking about natural abilities. He's saying also the gift of faith. Faith is a spiritual gift. And sometimes it's got to be stirred up. Even if we've got faith like a little tiny mustard seed. God says, that's enough. Stir it up. Faith is shameless. We just read that verse. There is no cause for shame when it comes to the gospel and believing in Jesus. Faith is a shield. Paul said to Timothy, use your faith to guard and protect the good things in your life. And the same in Ephesians there from when it talks about the spiritual armor of God. Faith is a shield. Defensive, not an offensive weapon. It's a defense. Guard what he's put in your life by faith. 
And it also, faith is to be searched for. It's to be pursued, chased after. That's what Paul says to Timothy. He goes, so pursue it. Run after it by faith. That might surprise you a little bit. Sometimes we kind of go, well, I'm just going to wait till the feelings of faith kick in because I don't feel so good. Well, do you know what? Again, it's okay to acknowledge the reality of our fears in the natural, but in the supernatural, we have faith in Jesus and, and, and the ability of our God to step in. And ultimately, that's the faith that Timothy stepped out in as he visited those churches and he trained those leaders. From the young man whose fears he could have easily derailed him if he'd told himself, no, I'm not good enough. I can't do that. It's not my job. Instead, he became a strong and wise servant in the early church. Hallelujah. And that's what God wants for us today. Have a look at this verse from uh, Hebrews 11. Have we got that one there? I think this is a wonderful biblical definition of faith. Now, faith is confidence in what we hope for. We have a wonderful hope in our Savior Jesus, don't we? Confidence in what we hope for and an assurance about what we do not see. There are times when maybe we can't see it that far ahead. We might feel anxious. We might feel afraid. But by faith, we can stand in what we know and in who we know. So let me ask you, are there false fears that you've been living with? They might be little things. They might be big things. They might be things that have just played on your mind the last few days, few weeks. They might be things you've been living with for many years. Maybe it's to do with your health. Maybe it's around your finances and how you're going to make ends meet. Maybe it's around your relationships, family, friends. Maybe it's even around your walk with Jesus. You have some genuine concerns about, well, I know God's there, but does he really love me? Is Jesus really in my life? You can knock that one on the head today. If you want to invite Jesus into your life, you can do that in just a few minutes. I'll lead you in a prayer in a few moments. Hey, when was the last time that you stirred up your faith and pursued it relentlessly? Faith has to be stirred up. It has to be pursued. Me as a pastor, I've been walking with Jesus 30 years. I have to constantly keep reminding myself to stir up faith. It doesn't just happen. We've got to break out of our fear patterns, our complacency, and sometimes that's scarier than anything. So today, let's acknowledge the reality of our circumstances, but live out the truth by faith. If you receive nothing else from this message today, that verse, God has not given you a spirit of fear, but one of power and of love and a sound mind. Amen? Let's stand together. I want to lead you in a, in a time of prayer, and we've got time here this morning just to allow the Holy Spirit to speak to our hearts, to God, to, to minister to us. And so I want to invite you to, to bow your heads. and This is going to be a very personal time between you and the Lord. Maybe you've really connected with some of the things I've been talking about this morning, whether you're young, whether you're old. Maybe there's fears you've been living with a long time. Maybe there's some circumstances even at the moment just going down in your life where you're like, I, I really need faith. I really need help in this area. God is there for you. Let me lead you uh, in a prayer now. Oh, Father, we give thanks. We give thanks for who you are, Lord. Because you are faithful. You love us unconditionally. And you have not given us a spirit of fear. Even though some of the circumstances and situations we face might be scary. They might be, seem big. They might seem insurmountable. And yet, Lord, what you have given us 
is power to stand against those things. You've given us love. And you've given us a renewed mind that when we stand in the truth of your promises, when we step out in faith, you step in with your power. We thank you for that, Lord. And so we bring our hearts before you this morning. While we're in this attitude of prayer, heads still bowed, just no one looking around. God may be speaking to you, even at this very moment. Maybe you're thinking, well, I don't even know where I'm at with Jesus. You can have him in your life in that same way that I, I talked about. You can have him, a personal relationship with him and experience those things. And so I want to invite you, if that's you this morning, I'm going to lead you in a prayer in a moment. You don't need to pray it out loud. You can just, between you and God. Or maybe, maybe you've prayed that prayer before, but you feel like you haven't been walking with Jesus. Maybe you haven't uh, felt as if you've been walking with him and you want to renew that relationship with him this morning. Just while we're in this attitude of prayer, no one looking around, I want to invite you just to raise your hand. And if that's you this morning, you want to invite Jesus by faith into your heart, just raise your hand now. He is at work in your circumstance. Thank you. Thank you. I see that hand. You can pop it down. Thank you, Jesus. Or you want to recommit your heart and life to him. Yes. Just another moment. I'm going to lead us in a prayer now. And you can just pray this in your, your heart. Father God, I acknowledge that I need you in my life. And I thank you because you gave your very best, your son Jesus, for me. Lord, I know that I can't do it in my own strength. And so I open my heart to you. Jesus, come into my life. Change me on the inside. Transform my heart. I commit my life over to you. Now and forevermore, I want to walk with you, Jesus. Have your way in my life, I pray. In Jesus' mighty name, amen.